Hello and welcome to Nudge, the consumer psychology podcast where we delve into the world of behaviour science to better understand how our brains work. I'm Phil Agnew and today I'm excited to present a topic that I know many of you have been asking for, how to apply nudge theory and behaviour science within your business or project or organisation. We know that nudges can dramatically affect behavior of consumers, but many of us still struggle to implement these ideas into our work. People are resistant to change, management tend to prefer the status quo, and colleagues may question the validity of your suggestions. So to help us understand how to start nudging within a business, I'm joined by Richard Chataway. Richard Chataway is Vice President of the BVA Nudge Unit UK. He's one of the most experienced behaviour science practitioners in the UK. He has worked in senior strategic roles for government in Australia and the UK, and in the four largest advertising agency groups. In these roles, he's addressed behavioural challenges as varied as getting people to stop smoking, join the armed forces, drink spirits rather than wine, and even take public transport. He's also just released his first book, The Behaviour Business. It's a brilliant read that provides clear frameworks for practitioners looking to apply behaviour science to their work. To start off, I asked Richard what first interested him in behaviour science. So I guess my interest in behavioural science and psychology more generally, uh, I guess started in, a, in the mid noughties when I was working, I'd, been, I'd started my career working in the, the media agency world and then for various reasons, had made a switch into public sector, and I'd, I I went to work at the Department of Health, and there I was a, a campaigns manager working on anti-smoking cam, uh, campaigns. So um, a lot of those scary ads you might remember from the mid noughties with people with hooks in their mouths and stuff like that. And what was really interesting was at, the, uh, at that point there was a moment when our head of tobacco policy. So the guy who was responsible for all the government's anti-smoking initiatives, uh, he, he did a leaving speech because he was moving to another job. And he said to us all, you know, the work we're doing here is saving more lives than uh, some surgeons do in their entire career. And I was like, wow, that's not only is that incredibly inspirational, but that's also really interesting in terms of the potential for an understanding of human behavior to have an impact. Although that quote sounds grandiose, it's really true. Richard's team dramatically changed the UK's anti-smoking advertisements after taking inspiration from behaviour science. Historically, these anti-smoking ads were very rational. They clearly explained why smoking was bad for you, how it increased your chance of cancer and how it harmed those around you. This rational approach seemed smart, but it goes against our behaviour science understanding. By the mid-2000s, smokers knew the negative effects of smoking, so reminding them again of this barely changed their behaviour. It simply wasn't salient anymore, and it failed to convince and persuade. So Richard's team moved to a different approach, more emotive language that would capture attention and convince smokers in a different way. The 2003 ad showed a cigarette split down the middle, with a fatty, rancid deposit shown inside the cigarette. The accompanying text stated, Every cigarette we smoke makes fatty deposits stick in our arteries. This ad introduced a whole new scare factor to smoking, jolting people out of their normal deference and actually convincing people to take action. According to the British Health Foundation, 50% of smokers who saw this ad telephoned the helpline to attempt to quit. And as a direct response of the ad, 14,000 people gave up smoking, far more than any previous campaign had achieved. But that team had a £9 million budget. Now, most of us would be lucky to get 1% of that budget. So how can we introduce similar changes on a shoestring? Well, I'll hand back to Richard, who explains exactly how he did just that for the Australian Public Health Department. One of the first challenges that we were given, um, again, was, was smoking. And, and the agency had already uh, spoken to the, uh, the government clients to say, well, have you considered developing an app? And this was in 2012. Mobile apps were still still re- reasonably new technology, but you know th- there was potential for that. And um, and fortunately as well, we were in a we had a slightly a slight perfect storm, which was that the government didn't have a huge amount of money to spend. So the kind of five million dollar ad campaigns that traditionally they were using as a as a method of of persuading smokers to quit wasn't within budget. Uh, so they were looking at other solutions. And when I joined, because I'd come from from the COI and from the Department of Health in the UK, 
I brought that understanding to it. And so when we when we pitched the mobile app to the uh, to the federal government, we incorporated or my strategic my strategy for that incorporated lots of what you might call nudges um, and lots of behavioral techniques into the functionality of, of building that app, such as, for example, every time you open the mobile app, it would tell you how long it was since your last uh, cigarette, how much money you'd saved, how much tar you'd avoided, um, visualizing the benefits that you should be feeling in terms of your health. Um, and so on and, and that app which was called my quit buddy um, we we developed um, uh, very quickly within within eight weeks um, and it worked spectacularly well so um, within the first eight weeks we got a hundred thousand downloads but what was a really interesting insight for me around the application of behavioral science and behavioral insights was that we could really adopt what what's known in the tech world as a as an MVP a minimal minimum viable product approach as in the version of the app that went out within the first eight weeks was the the bare minimum that we could get out there. So we needed an app that 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 worked and and would have some of those uh, behavioural nudges built into it. But we had to have something that we could build in eight weeks. So what happened was um was once we did the initial launch, we were then getting gathering data and and feedback from users that we could use to continually optimize the app and sort of test and learn as we went. And as a result of that, seven years, oh, sorry, eight years later now in 2020, in 2020 um, the app's still going strong. Um, it's had, had over half a million downloads, um, which by, by my estimation is about between one in three and one in four smokers in Australia have used the app to help them quit smoking. And the, the quitting success rate are eight times what you would expect by just by going cold turkey without any any form of support. The My Quit Buddy app is pretty basic. If you Google it, you'll notice that the designs are kind of out of date, but it's incredibly successful because it's absolutely jam-packed with nudges. Firstly, it increases saliency by personalizing figures for the individual, saying how much money they've saved, how much tar they've avoided, and how many days they've spent smoke-free. As these stats build up, the endowment effect kicks in, this is where we're more likely to complete a project that's already started. Then, as the stats start to get high, for example a streak of 52 days smoke-free, loss aversion kicks in, and suddenly we want to keep going simply so we don't lose our streak. Finally, the app uses social proof by letting users know how well others are doing. This combination of nudges resulted in half a million downloads, making it one of the most successful non-smoking apps in the world. Richard gives great examples of how these same nudges have been used in other public and private organisations. Facebook, for example, used social proof to encourage voting in the 2010 general election. They deployed an I voted button that showed a user had voted during the election. Versions of the button, or no button at all, were shown to 61 million people, and in a joint study with the University of California in San Diego and Facebook's data scientists, they used voting records to determine the button's impact on actual real-world voting. And it turns out, the button's call to action increased the total vote count by 340,000 votes. In fact, social proof is so effective that if it's used incorrectly, it can encourage the wrong behaviours. For example, highlighting the high amount of alcohols drunk by students on a university campus, for example saying the average student drinks 10 pints a week isn't this bad, that actually led to the average student drinking more. This 1993 study highlighted what we now call negative social proof. And Richard showcased the power of loss aversion himself in consultancy work he did for a major online banking call centre. He found that most customers didn't bother listening to any of the banking benefits the call reps would share. The reps would recite these benefits, but most listeners took no action. However, when he instructed the reps to say, if you don't take action now, you'll miss out on this unique offer, he found that customers were far more likely to take up the offer. Highlighting that consumers would lose out if they didn't act now dramatically changed behaviour. Anyway, I'll hand back to Richard, who now goes on to explain how anyone can start applying these nudges within their business. In order to apply it, you don't need to have a PhD in behavioral science, I think is a really critical point. Um, and, you know, and, and I don't, you know, I've, I've, I'm very clear at the, the beginning of the book to say um, that, you know, I am a practitioner and, and I've learned on the job, if you like, in terms of, you know, what I was just describing with my, my background in 
particularly in government, you know, the, the critical thing really is is for a business to apply um, behavioural science successfully is one to be to be comfortable with that um, what I call test tube behaviours, which is that kind of a bit or willingness to test and to learn and to uh, you know to accept that one of the critical aspects of experimentation and testing and learning and and a scientific approach is that some things won't work that you will test some things that don't work and that, and that fail. But that's not a bad thing. That's, you know, those insights and, and what you learn from that is as important as the things that do work um, because you know you should never do those things or or it will give you some insight that might unlock another another opportunity. Um, and that's one, one critical aspect to it. I think the other is obviously, you know, is making sure that you are using the most, the best insights and understanding of the science um, and whether that's a case of, you know, you hire people who have that background um, to inform your business. One one interesting trend we're seeing in the last few years is that more and more um, larger global corporates are creating roles like chief behavioral officer or, or or hiring people who have that background. You know, one thing I was very I was very conscious of when writing the book is that, you know, a lot of the examples I use are from, you know, the fangs, for example. So Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. And my reason for doing that is to say these businesses have been hugely successful in the 21st century because of the way that they understand, use and apply behavioural science as much as it, if not more so, as, the, as their technological innovation. But I, I was very conscious when writing the book of, of wanting to write it in a way where if you are a sole trader or a small business owner or, or you know you don't have access to all the world's leading computer science uh, PhDs, as, as Google does, that you can still apply the insights from that. Richard's right. We shouldn't disregard attempts to apply behaviour science simply because we don't have the resource to collect huge amounts of data or conduct a plethora of analysis. A much simpler and smarter way is to conduct a randomly controlled trial. This is where you apply your nudge to a randomly assigned group and compare the results to the control where no nudge is used. Richard has used this in marketing, business growth, but also employee engagement too. While consulting at the call centre, he introduced a number of welfare initiatives to see if they boosted motivation. He brought in adjustable standing desks, painted the walls a shade of blue that apparently aided concentration, and printed 3D representations of each employee's financial goals, like a 3D printout of the car you want. Richard didn't just implement these and hope for the best, he tested the results by comparing the nudged group to the control who weren't nudged at all. And he found that well-being, as declared by staff, went up by 12% and retention increased by 80%. At Richard's consultancy, he encouraged a leading national newspaper to make a fairly significant change without months of research, but simply by using randomised control trials. The newspaper used to offer... 120 different subscription options on their website. Each different package was supposed to help readers find their niche. So one reader could pick a sports plus finance plus politics package, while another could have a beauty plus fitness plus cooking package. But as the scarcity effect reveals, consumers don't actually want more choice. Instead, they want an easy choice. So when Richard introduced a controlled test to reduce the number of subscriptions from 120 right down to 8, he found that doing so actually increased sales by nearly 5% when comparing it to the control. These simple-to-use tests can be applied in any business of any size with really great effect. In fact, some of the most innovative product developments have come out of this approach, including Amazon Prime. I think the Amazon Prime example is a really interesting one. One because it's firstly, you know, Amazon is such a ubiquitous product now. I think it's one that that we're all familiar with. And the other is that I think the really interesting as, aspect of it is that they'd modelled what they thought the success of Amazon Prime would be before they introduced it as a service. And what's really really interesting about that is that they, before Amazon introduced it, they conducted some econometric modelling to forecast the success of it and the econometric modeling predicted it would be a disaster that it would cost them millions of dollars in uh, in in losses as a result of the fact that you know that they weren't now charging separately for um for uh, delivery costs what was um was interesting was that despite that amazon a decided to test it anyway um just with a limited number of, of consumers and b that the you know the reason that they thought it, it still was worth testing was because there was a behavioral insight that sits behind the power of free which is that and dan Ariely in particular has done a lot of uh, really interesting work around this and experiments around this 
is that when you uh, provide something for free, it generates a really strong feeling of reciprocity. You know, it's effectively treated like a gift. So if someone gives you something for free, you feel much more favourable towards them. Someone makes you a cup of tea, you feel you owe them a cup of tea in return. Someone gives you a gift, then you feel that you ought to return the favour. The theory was, was that actually that would make Amazon customers on the Prime product or taking purchasing the prime product would be more loyal and that's exactly what they found so the average amazon prime customer in the u.s spends twice as much per year and visits the site twice as often Um, which which is really interesting on a number of levels as i say both because it demonstrates that power free but also what it's it's demonstrating is that those Prime customers have, uh, Amazon has become, become much more their kind of default for purchasing. They're much more habitual in terms of the way that they're using the site uh, and therefore will be of greater long-term value to Amazon. Because what was interesting was when they did that power-free test, they actually did find that in the first year it did lose the money. But over the long term, it was much more, uh, those customers, Amazon Prime customers are much more profitable. And as a result, they obviously rolled out the product on a global basis. The nudge that encouraged Amazon to push forward with Prime was the power of free. I first heard about it while reading Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely. In the book, Dan explains how framing something as free can irrationally shift behavior. To test it, he offered his students two types of chocolates, a Hershey Kiss and a Lint Chocolate Truffle. Now, the Hershey Kiss is an inexpensive and common treat, while the Lindt truffle is a far more tasty confection that costs an order of magnitude more than the kiss. In the first experiment, Dan offered the students a truffle for 15 cents or a kiss for one cent. Now in this example, 75% of the students, the vast majority, chose the truffle, which seems pretty logical based on the relative value of the truffle compared to the kiss. In the next experiment, he reduced the price of each product by one cent. Now, the truffle was 14 cents, but the kiss was free. Although the price differential remained the same, the behaviour of the subjects changed dramatically. Now, 66% of the subjects chose the free chocolate kiss over the bargain price truffle. It reveals an irrational tendency we have to prefer free things, and it's exactly how Amazon made Prime so appealing. It should come as no surprise to learn that Amazon, Google and the like implement these ideas all the time because they are constantly testing. For example, the shade of blue that is used to show results in the Google toolbar is the result of testing over 40 different colours to see what generated the most clicks. Apparently that tiny bit of optimization is estimated to generate over $200 million in additional annual revenue for Google. But Richard makes the point that every business should feel comfortable making these changes, even if they don't have a huge sample size to test with. One of the people I interviewed was Richard Shotton, who I know you've had on this on this podcast before, and Richard's a friend of mine, and and um, he has a great quote, how when you're testing, um, what's really important is representativeness rather than sample size. So thinking that if you come from the statistics world or social sciences world, then we're often you can often get a bit obsessed with with ensuring that you have robust sample sizes and p-scores and so on. Um, in, in the business world, we're not so concerned about that. We just want to see competitive advantage and we want to see something, as with the Amazon Prime example I've just given you, you know, we want to see something that works better than what you were doing before and certainly works better than your competitors. And, and Richard makes a really valid point that a lot of the critical, most well-known and most replicated social science experiments were actually initially done on a sample size of 50 or 60 people, you know, typically on a university campus somewhere in the, on the east coast of the US. The, the interesting thing about that is that there's no barriers to, to a business doing that themselves. One of the interesting insights around, you know, talk about our call centre work, when we did a project for a bank here in the UK um, and we were looking to incorporate nudges into the scripting we were using with that bank, um, to deliver a better customer experience, but also to achieve some business benefits in terms of better resolving customer queries, preventing callbacks, and actually shortening the duration of calls, which is which is interesting in itself in that people like to complete their transaction by phone, particularly with the bank, as quickly as possible. So there's an, there's an inverse correlation between the length of a, the time you spend on the phone to the bank and the quality of the customer experience. So we were implementing nudges within the scripting to do this. 
I guess my point is, is that the way we developed those was a from an understanding of behavioral science and an understanding of the evidence base around that, but b from actually working with the people in the call center. And so, you know, if you're not if you're not as a business using the knowledge of those people who work within your business and their experience to develop these hypotheses for testing, then you're missing out. I think a critical thing as well to bear in mind, which is another aspect that I cover in the book, is about you know how that is different to and can and can complement what you get from speaking to customers themselves a lot of what we do in the market research world and i work for a market research company you know it's based on on what people say rather than what they do and and you only get an incomplete picture by by actually looking what people say because because a lot of these biases and heuristics are non-conscious or not easily articulated by customers so so i guess yeah so so one of the things i would say to, to businesses you know who aren't in the aren't in the digital world or don't have you know these wealth of data points is again that you've got plenty of other sources that you can look at for more objective verifiable insightful data that will tell you about what is driving behavior of your customers the best businesses constantly test and iterate to better optimise consumer behaviour. But as Richard says, anyone can do it. Having a sample size of 40 or 50 people can be enough to discover a serious insight. In fact, it's how great behaviour scientists like Dan Ariely and Daniel Kahneman and many others discovered their insights. In the book, Richard gives great examples of how he's optimised consumer behaviour by carrying out just small tests like this. He's discovered that you can increase the number of packets of chips people buy by telling them they can only buy four. He's learned that you can decrease the length of a customer call by asking customers to slow down rather than speed up. And he's learned that you can increase the productivity and retention by hiring people who don't think they like each other rather than hiring people who are all alike. That's all from me today. I'd love to know what you thought about this episode and if you get around to applying any of these nudges yourself. So feel free to leave me a review on Apple Podcasts to let me know what you think or tweet me at Nudge Podcast. I'd like to give Richard a huge thank you for taking the time to come on the show. His book is fresh off the press so if you want to impress your colleagues with the latest thinking in behaviour science I really do recommend picking up a copy. I've put a link to buy the book in the show notes. I'll be back with Richard for another episode of Nudge in two weeks. In that show, we'll cover some of the flaws with modern day marketing and what marketers can learn from Nudge theory in general. To make sure you don't miss that episode, sign up to our mailing list by clicking the link in the show notes. Do that and I'll send you an email every time a new episode goes live. Thank you for listening to this episode of Nudge. 